Welcome to my Texas workshop. I'm Randy Lammers. I'm Aaron Keevan. This is Worth Knowing. We're pleased to continue our series on secondary retention. Aaron, we did a great episode on lock nuts and all the different types of lock nuts. Yep. And then followed that with an episode on wedge lock washers, right. which I was very exciting to yeah, do. Yeah, how, how's your tractor holding up? It's holding up really, really good, Aaron. So I mowed a heavy field with that. Outstanding. Awesome. Held up really, really good. Awesome. So what do we have today? Well, today we're going to finish out the series. We're going to talk about user applied and pre applied thread lockers something that's easy to apply and something we see all the time on assembly lines. Yep. We're very excited to bring to you today a couple of guests from ND Industries, Brad Gallagher and Scott Wickham. Tell us a little bit about ND Industries. Okay, thank you Randy, thank you Aaron for having us at your workshop. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to go through some of these uh, adhesives and thread lockers in more detail and have the audience understand what they do. Uh, ND Industries is a chemical company. We develop all of this, these uh, technologies, all the chemical technologies, um, and we manufacture them. We also have a processing center that's centrally located in many different areas throughout the world that pre-applies the material onto the threads. So anything to deal with thread locking, um, ND Industries is involved in on the chemical side. That's awesome. True right. vertical integration there. So. Um, on a yeah, global scale. On a global scale, that's, those are good things. So we've got a couple of different types of uh, lockers here. Can you explain a little bit about that, Brad? Yes, sir. So over here we have our pre-applied thread lockers. These come in inert and reactive type materials. And then moving along over here, we have our user applied bottle products uh, that would be done by the end user. Right, and the whole purpose here too is what? Why, why do we need this stuff? Clamp load. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, we talk about this yeah, all yes. the time. That's, always, that's our job, always that's about, our job. It's yes, always yeah. about clamp load. Yeah. So it's all about clamp load, um, keeping that clamp load and things that are inhibiting that, whether it's thermal shock, you've got vibration, you've got uh, dynamic loading, uh, you know, everything like that. Yeah, right. exactly. So we have taught you a lot about this issue in our previous retention uh, episodes. Make sure you watch those to pick all of the reasons why you lose clamp load. So with that, let's, let's start off with then our liquid, our user applied. Uh, Scott, you want to explain those to us? Sure, Randy. The material, the, the anaerobic materials all cure in the absence of air and the presence of metallic ions. So if I put this material out on this table, it's going to remain wet. What we need is the absence of air to kick that, that, uh, that reactive chemistry off. So when this is on the threads, you engage the thread. In between those threaded pieces, the reaction takes place due to the absence of air and the presence of that metallic ion. Okay. So the cool thing about these materials are they're generally uh, color coded. So we have materials that range from permanent thread locking, which is our red, uh, material, and then we have some lower strength materials with our medium strength thread lockers, and uh, ultimately we have a low strength uh, adhesive that is uh, easier to remove. In addition to the, the strengths, we also have a wicking uh, material that upon installation, you can put this material on there and the low viscosity of that material allows the uh, anaerobic material to run down the helix of the threads and cure within the mating pieces. Oh wow. So that's a product I'm not familiar with. So you're telling me after I assemble and I maybe forgot to put my material on there, I can do it after the fact. Or I just believe now I need that material. I can put that on there, it'll wick in and do what I need to do. That's correct. Yep. That's exciting stuff to have. That's yep. fantastic. All right, so now we know a little bit about our user applied, but how are they actually applied? What's the correct way to do that, Scott? Yeah, so a lot of people over apply the material. So they'll, they'll apply the material onto the threads until it's dripping onto the table or onto their shoes and just way too much material. Right. On a sales basis, we really love it. And we'll say, <laughs> as, long as, it, as long as that material hits your shoe, we're in good shape. <laughs> but in reality, all we want to do is put a few drops on and then it's going to find its own path. It's going to run that around the helix of the threads. So it's a really easy delivery method as well on the assembly line. So all you do is you take the top off, you lift up the dispensing nozzle and then you apply it onto the part. And again, you don't need as much of material as a lot of people apply. That'll dispense just one drop at a time. That's correct. Okay. So the liquids, user applied, very, very common. We see it in manufacturing plants very frequently. 
We also see those on moving assembly lines and sometimes it can be a little bit of a mess, Scott. So what do we do when we don't want to apply it on the assembly line? What's our options? Yeah, so, so like you mentioned, Randy, the material can be a little bit messy um, and it, it's, you know, a lot of times these bottles have a way of, of walking away and keeping track of the bottles and the inventory of those bottles is, a, is sometimes troublesome. So we do have solutions there um, and I'll, I'll let Brad talk a little bit about those. Yeah, so that's the pre-applied solutions over here. Uh, these are inert and reactive. So the inert would be the nylon patch type or a uh, thermoset plastic uh, material. Um, with that, we also have the reactive, which is uh, typically a two-part uh, epoxy or acrylic that will actually cure when you fasten it into the threads. Yeah, uh, uh, has the hardening agents and everything all Correct. encapsulated. It's in all there, encapsulated so. in one. Okay, encapsulated. Explain encapsulated. Well, so Randy, our, the the, adhe the epoxy adhesives on uh, the fastener, the pre-applied fasteners, right. uh, is very similar to a two-part epoxy that you buy at the, the hardware store. Okay. The two-part epoxy is represented here. Um, we have material on one side, we have material on the other side of this cartridge. They're kept separate uh, physically until they're dispensed through a, a mixing nozzle. Um, so you can kind of view this as the, the thread threads of a screw. Um, as they're applied, um, as the material is dispensed, goes through, mixes, um, and finally cures. Now, you don't use this on threaded fasteners, but what we did was develop a material that is separated but in the same system. So on the part, we have the epoxy resin and we have the um, hardener. We have to keep those things separated up until engagement. Once that engagement takes place, the microencapsulated epoxy will then burst as you engage further, it will mix and then that will cure it in place. So the, the cool thing about the, our materials is the way that it started. So we start with a liquid epoxy, very thick material, and then through the magic of chemistry, we encapsulate those epoxy, um, the epoxy particles. So we make the material into a droplet form and then through a series of chemical reactions, we form a shell wall around each droplet of epoxy. Then that epoxy microencapsulated material is then incorporated into our solution that has the uh, amine in there, the hardener in the material, um, and that's what creates that reaction once so installed. So you can pre-apply that, and that's done, I understand, as a spray? That is actually done as a liquid. So the material is pre-applied in a liquid form. Okay. It goes through a drying process to drive off uh, the carrier, either water or solvent. And then at that point, it is ready to be um, stored or used in the assembly. Okay, so it's dry to touch. That's dry to and touch. And we can put it in bulk packaging and ship it into your assembly lines already ready to install. It's, you don't forget anything. It's there. It's always going to be installed. That's correct. Okay, very, very good. Now, you have both epoxies and then you have what I, what I always call acrylics. Acrylics, That's yeah. Correct. Yeah, so, so the, the material is generally the the same concept. We have two reactive components that we have to keep separated. In the case of the epoxy, we encapsulate that. Now, in the case of the acrylic, it's a little bit different chemistry. Uh, it's an activator type chemistry, and that is what we encapsulate in the acrylic form. So what we do is we encapsulate that activator upon installation, the activator is released, and that reacts with the acrylic. Okay, so these come in different strengths? They do. We have different strengths. We have different formulations of materials for coefficient of friction reduction for higher temperature, for higher strength type materials, um, and along with a lot of different types of applications that really we kind of do this on an application by application basis on what we would specify. Okay, so when would I know I need an epoxy versus when would I know I need an acrylic? So, so again, it's all basically um, application dependent. Um, but the epoxy is our workhorse, and that's generally the one that we direct uh, towards most people if they're using um, uh, fasteners that may be contaminated or mating pieces that might have some residual oil or other types of contamination. Good for them. all surfaces, right? It's that's an all-purpose, that that's correct. That. We see it used a lot over phosphate and oil. We did a series on pho that included phosphate and oil uh, and or black oxide and oil, and so this would actually go right over the top of that, and the epoxy will bond. That's correct. Yes, it's a much more uh, forgiving system for use on uh, oil or any other types of contamination. Okay, so good reason for epoxies there. Right. And then the acrylics? Uh, so the acrylics, we can we have those custom formulated for lower coefficient of friction and higher temperature properties. 
Um, but the acrylics give you a little bit more flexibility as far as formulation. So we have a lot of different types of formulation um, and we continue to formulate uh, the acrylics. It's a little bit more forgiving or a little bit more adjustable as far as the formulation. Okay, got that. Okay, so I, I know that the liquids are one-time use. Once you break that loose, that you're really, you're really done. Uh, the uh, the pre-applied adhesives in the epoxies and the acrylics, they're also one-time use, correct? They are one-time use. So again, once that material is installed, the reaction will take place. Um, 24 hours later um, is when you do the breakaway torque or you can do the breakaway torque. Um, and I should mention as well that it is um, uh, IFI specified material uh, to the IFI 120 Five or the five, 525, depending on the yeah. standard or metric. The Industrial metric. Fastener Institute specification. That's correct. Okay. So again, once the, the material is broken loose, at that point the reaction is, is broken and you have, would have to grab a new piece uh, with the coated adhesive on there. So the Industrial Fastener Institute gives you minimum guidelines, but at the same time you publish specific uh, test criteria that you uh, meet on the individual products that far exceed the IFI 125, 525 specifications, correct? Right, that's correct. So for instance, on um, uh, 3 8 fastener, um, typical phosphate finish, we're probably gonna be at breakaways around 300 inch pounds or, or somewhere in that area, uh, far exceeding the IFI uh, 525 requirements. All right, answer this question. You've mentioned it a couple of times now, and I frequently get asked, what's the difference between break loose torque and breakaway torque? Because it's all really, we, we judge these based on the breakaway torque you need for your assembly. What's the difference between break loose and breakaway? Uh, the, the breakaway torque is the adhesive alone. So there's no clamp load induction at all. There's no, there was no clamp load induced on the joint at all. Okay. The break loose torque is the curing um, in a clamped condition. So that, that's your break loose torque. So it basically, it combines breakaway plus clamp load break, break loose. That's correct. So it's a combination. So it's your total joint breaking that loose after uh, assemble. Right. Okay. So we've talked about our reactive type of thread lockers. Now what about the innards, Brad? Yeah, so unlike the reactive, which is an adhesive bond, you have a mechanical bond with the inert products. Okay. So there's a few different inert products and start here we have the pellet, which is physically altering the fastener and inserting a nylon pellet into the, into the thread. Mm -hmm. And then with that, we also have a strip, which is the same concept. You're, you're altering the fastener, putting a strip into it, and going right. that route. Right, we see a lot of that in uh, still use in aerospace. Correct, yeah. correct. All right, so we also have a nylon patch, and this is actually a powder form of nylon that gets uh, sprayed onto a heated fastener and creates a bond that way. And uh, these are all part of a uh, IFI 524 and uh, 124 spec. Right. Okay, very good. And that is just induction heated at the point you're putting the nylon. Correct, locally induction heated at the point of the nylon. Okay, that's We also have a different type of product that uh, I think you guys have worked on, you know, been around for a little bit. It's but. been around for a little bit, but this is a blend of acrylic resins suspended in a solvent. Um, and this can be actually user applied. There's a brush inside the bottle. Okay. It can be pre-applied, much like our other fasteners here. Or uh, we actually have a product that's a tape form. Of, of, the, of the material. Right, like a PTFE or something you see it's in plumbing. Sort of, yeah, it's just like Similarity. that. You, just, you coat it, wow. you just roll it onto it. That's fantastic. That's a new product, and I'm anxious to see that. Yep. So that's really cool. Now, what about the benefits that we have here? Yeah, right. absolutely. Uh, the, the benefits are uh, if you want to be able to reuse it, uh, that's a huge thing. The reusability is, uh, you know, they're based on the specs, it's about five times. Uh, we've seen more than that, so we're going to say minimum of five times. Sure. Uh, we've seen up to 15 and, and beyond. So. Very good. So great reusability. Great usability. Where I need to reuse. Correct. Okay. What about shelf life? Because I'm looking at this, these nylon patches, the nylon pellets, the strips, do they have a shelf life? And the reactives too. So yeah, correct. So the, the nylon patch is pretty much indefinite. Uh, you don't really have to worry about that. As for the reactive ones, in optimal conditions, we're looking at about a year. Okay, about so retest after one year? Retest after one year. Okay, all right, very good. What's our biggest factor in that? Is it heat or humidity? Both. Both, <laughs> okay. Yes. No, that's, that's, that's a very good answer to that. So, excellent, all right. So we're going to demonstrate the nylon patch and how that works against a uh, non-patched material. But before we get there, 
We've mentioned COF a couple of times, so we've done our best to teach you about the K factor, the coefficient of friction within your joint. When you add these products to your assembly, that will change your torque to tension relationship. So test your application because it is dependent on the fastener finish you're applying these to. Each one of these has its own coefficient of friction, so it all changes. Test your application. With that, let's do a demonstration. All right, Scott, we've got our safety glasses on, which we always have to do in case something goes haywire. Tell us about this machine that you brought with you today and how this demonstration works. Sure, Randy, this is a, a transverse shock and vibration machine, other known as the Yonkers. Uh, we're gonna clamp the, the fasteners into the machine. Uh, we're gonna clamp it down today, today to uh, 20 kilonewtons, and we're gonna run the cycle until there's only 5% clamp load left. That 5% clamp load or 300 cycles, whichever comes first. Okay, very good. And we already have this set up, so let's start this and see what we have with just a hex nut and hex head cap screw as our starting point. Okay, so it's all set up. All I have to do hit is go. Okay, Scott, what were those results? So if you remember, we, we uh, took it to a preload of 20 kilonewtons. Right. Uh, we ran the cycles. Uh, I set it for 5% left clamp load, so 95% right. clamp load loss. Um, after 295 cycles, we have a clamp load of 1.1 kilonewton. Okay, all right, that's a good starting place. Now, let's test against that. Okay, we have reset the machine. Just as another demonstration, we have installed a helical lock washer that we've talked about before. A lot of times is misused, but we wanna see how it works in this demonstration. So again, around about 20 kilonewtons, and let's see what happens here. Very good. Okay, Scott, what are our results here? So the results here, the helical lock washer went about 262 cycles before it re reached 95% uh, clamp load loss. So right now the current uh, preload at 262 cycles is one kilonewton. Okay, so we are a lot of times are telling you, be careful of where you use these helical lock washers. And we've told you before, sometimes they can be detrimental to your joint. I think that's an example of it right there on this test. Let's set up our nylon patch and let's see how that performs. Very good. All right, Scott, you have installed the nylon patch fastener, but I've got a couple of questions for you first. So utilizing our large bolt that we have here, that has the nylon patch on it, I observe that this patch is only applied 180 degrees on one side. I see that you left a couple of threads to start the, the, the bolt, but explain why is this patch only on one side? Sure. And let, let, me, let me start by talking about the lead threads. So generally, if the lead threads are available, we like to leave a couple lead threads for ease of start. Okay. Um, now the material that is on just part of that fastener, mm -hmm. it creates a very strong wedge in between the mating threads. So that, okay. that nylon powder to thread contact on one side creates a jam or a, a wedge on the opposite side. So you have a strong metal to metal contact and a very positive lock. So your lock is on the plain metal to plain metal on this side, this is actually, basically, it's not really locking there, it's just creating the wedge to push it over. That's correct, it's creating that mechanical lock or wedge. Okay, very good. I'm gonna ask you the next question. What happens, why is it sometimes I do see this patch applied 360 degrees around? So the patch applied 360 degrees around, um, that offers an added sealing ability. Okay. So that, that jams up or, or dams up the, the helical of each mating thread. Okay, but it's a locking. So yep. that, that way the patch itself is creating the locking feature, not the metal to metal. That's correct. It's a different method of, of locking. Correct. Okay, that explains that. Let's run this test and see the performance. Sure. Okay, what are our results? Okay, so same preload as the other two uh, examples. After 300 cycles, we are now um, at 82% of the remaining preload. So right now, the current preload is 16.4 after the 300 cycles. Outstanding. Nylon patch really makes a difference, and it's reusable. 
Thank you, Scott, for that demonstration. Thank you. Scott, that was an excellent demonstration. It really demonstrated the benefit of adding a nylon patch to the application and reusable, which I really like that. In conclusion, we have shown you an array of products that are very good thread lockers, and they all have unique benefits. Yeah, Randy, so we started talking about the user applied, the bottle product, or the point of assembly adhesive. So there's a lot of benefits to using that. There's, if for low volume uh, products, so grab, grab the bottle, apply some of that material onto the threads. It's an, uh, a quick reaction. Once that product's installed, it's a very quick reaction. Um, and then just the, the ability of being able to put it on a lot of different types of fasteners. Exactly. exactly. Right. Yeah, and then you had the pre-applies we talk about. I mean, Brad, what, what do we get benefits from those? Yeah, so there's a vast amount of benefits on the pre-applied. There's, uh, you know, with the, the consistency of having a patch come into you, not having to use the, you know, a bottle product or something like that, uh, the efficiency of that, the cost effectiveness, the quality that you're going to get out of it, it's, it's got a lot of benefits. Yeah, you're, you pick up and go, yes, right? It's absolutely. already ready for you. So. I would also say the assurance that every assembly had the he adhesive on it. Yep. And the same amount every time. And the same amount every time. I want to thank ND Industries, Scott, Brad, thank you for being on the show today. Yeah, You've brought you a lot of value to our audience. I thank really you. appreciate that. Think about thread lockers for secondary retention and the right product for your application. Thread lockers for secondary retention, that's worth knowing. We've got a lot of great content coming your way, so make sure to subscribe.